I'm super excited to have Nina with us today. She's the CEO of ANN, and I probably should have had her here sooner since she's graciously provided this space for us for a long time. So I'm super happy to have you here. And ANN was founded in 2002 in 17 states and is an A plus on the Better Business Bureau. Mm -hmm. And so Nina is also an investor. She does fix and flips. And also she does divorce meeting planning, which is a special thing that I didn't even know about. Mm -hmm. And maybe most importantly, she's a mother of three. That must be my LinkedIn bio. <laughs> it is. Yeah. Um, but yeah, could you give us, you know, just kind of maybe another rundown on mm -hmm. uh, who you are, uh, sure. about the business, and then we can kind of like dive into some more questions. Absolutely. Sounds good. So um, thank you all for coming. A lot of you have been here. Um, this is our She Shed. This is the event space that we have utilized during COVID or a little bit before COVID started because the guy couldn't pay his rent anymore. And I was very afraid to speak about being fearful because during COVID, my billboard guy stopped paying this stopped paying. And then I have few three rental properties and all of a sudden I was vacant on everything and it was beyond scary, but we seem to have managed through. And I think that some of the best things that came out of that um, were being able to advertise on the billboard instead of collecting the rent. I, you know, we probably got a lot more return out of that. And then being able to network in a safe, secure space here, which has been wonderful. I should have spoken a long, a long time ago. You're right. Yeah. But I love how you stay consistent with what you're doing. So I think that's really important. Um, so the, the space has, um, I, I mean, I was afraid. I was really, really afraid. So, But the space has come around tenfold because we are able to grow and do things like this. And it's a lot different than other companies have, right? So I took that and just figured it out. So um, we uh, we do a lot of different types of lending. There's a folder here that I kind of put together with, we do reverse mortgages, fix and flips, commercial loans up to a lot, 150 million. So a lot of developers will work with us um, and then residential loans. So we have some niche products. If it makes sense, we're probably going to do the deal. If it's not great credit, we can work with the person to fix their credit and get them on a good path. So those are some of the things that we do here. Can you give us like some background of your beginning story, like before a &N? like how did you get started? Uh, what prompted you to start a mortgage company? Maybe what you did before the mortgage company? Sure, absolutely. So um, I started the company it, when I was, I think I was 27 years old. So I was very young and I was somewhat fearless at that point because I didn't have a family um, and, you know, there wasn't all these mouths to feed. So I just kind of jumped in and started. So I went to college at UIC and I have 12 hours left to get my master's. At first, I thought I wanted to be a college professor and my parents kept pushing me to become, go into sales, go into sales. So I worked at m and Bank um, for a very short period of time and then started my own business pretty quick, like quickly after that. So this is really the only place I've worked, you know? So, so what prompted <laughs> starting a &N, though? Like, did you oh, so my old boss, yes, yes. Um, not much. Yeah. I know it sounds really random, but I didn't have a lot of background in it. I worked for a very short time and I just knew that I could do it better and I could be a better person. I, I believe in service of others. So I'm always asking, how can I help you? What can I do? And when I'm serving others, that brings me the most happiness. And that's, the only time I'm really, really happy. So by helping others grow in their career paths, I found that I was more successful and happy. It's awesome. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I don't think I can echo that enough that once you start serving others, it really changes your life, or at least it changed my life. Because I mean, even just having the space in itself is obviously a service that we're all super grateful for. And uh, so ANN for 17 years. Can you kind of talk about when you got started and because of kind of how I look at business and real estate is like every part of real estate is running a business. So when you're getting going, mm -hmm. uh, I know personally how difficult it is um, to be putting food on the table and trying to get the business up and running. Like what were some of those early on struggles with a and um, So back when I first started, I... Um, I haven't had to tell the story in so long. So I just had to think for a minute. We didn't practice at all, just so everybody knows. <laughs> um, so um, when I when I opened, <laughs> it's 
Do you have the Do you have the box? Where is the box? Oh, he's got it. Okay. Do you, no. That part out of the video. I probably was gonna. I probably was gonna say something I shouldn't have. So that was okay. <laughs> That's probably better. Um. So when I when I opened A and N, I started uh, with five employees. A uh, few of the employees are still here with us today, which is a testament to how we treat others here and and how good we are. Some of the struggles that we have had is the market, right? So there's the good and the bad. We started off banking. I mean, we started off brokering loans and then we started off banking subprime loans. So we would literally meet with each client and um, counsel them. I'd put the loans on our books and pray nobody paid late or did anything wrong. And then we'd follow up with them continuously to make sure that they were improving their credit. And then eventually this all this demographic and all these clients um, became better and they became they had good credit all of a sudden. Right. So over time right? It, everything seemed to have improved. So during the, the hard times when I started, I would, um, well, I canceled my honeymoon. I got married and then I canceled my honeymoon. I said, Dean, I want to open a company. Um, he was like, okay. So that was, that was okay with him, but was that the right choice? Probably not a good idea for your marriage. Right. Um, so I made some really stupid mistakes when I was younger. Um, and then, um, the other things I would do is I would work all day. So our office was at 1535 North Dayton in the Menominee Club. And I would go to work and I lived on Dayton Street. So I would go to work and then I'd work all day. I'd literally handwrite all the paychecks, take out the Fed, all the FICA taxes. And then I'd still originate about 20 loans myself a month to cover the overhead. So in that career path, that was stupid. I should have never done any of that. But I know how to get in and out of payroll. I know how to do things. And I'm pretty efficient, I would say, with what I can achieve during the day. But the mistakes I made is like that book, do it, delegate it or defer it. If it takes you less than two minutes, I, I still do it. But if it really takes me more than like 10 minutes, I still do it, which is bad. That's a bad <laughs> trait to have because you really should be delegating off as much so that you can become a master of scale. Um, that is a really important thing to be able to do. Are there any hacks you're using now to be more efficient that you didn't use Mm -hmm. during that time? Yeah. So I think some of the things like going to software for payroll, Paylocity um, has been a big help when you're growing. I don't know how many employees we have, but maybe, I don't know, 90 or hundred, I think. Um, instead of using a ton of Excel spreadsheets for the payroll and all the, the end of the year stuff, that that has helped a lot, yeah. a lot, a lot, a lot. So paying, paying for software is, is important and making sure that you have a job role, job description, a career path for each each person is is huge because they need to know what direction they're going into. So I think I've really improved. I've always had good communication because I'm very close with each of the people that work here um, or I don't want them to work here because I want that bond in order to stay successful. I think that you have to know who you're working with and what what makes them tick. Did you, the happiness. Did you really focus on staying locally when you got started? Were mm -hmm. you only taking loans on that were Chicagoland? Yeah, that's our footprint. So I always think you do better in your footprint areas. So we do have a lot of licenses and organically I've grown. Um, so if a client's moving and some of the LOs are like, or Ian's like, hey, we have clients and they're moving here. Are you licensed here? And then I've gotten three calls during the year from that. Okay, well then that goes on the hot list. Okay, well then we plan out 2024 Q1, Q2, Q3, Q4. Problem with that is I didn't do my data. So like I got licensed in Alabama thinking, oh, there's people we could help there. But if the median average income is 32,000, that, that wasn't a smart business move. So I lead a lot with my heart and I do need to get better at data, mm -hmm. I would say. Yeah, I think like from an investor standpoint, there's like nothing you can do, especially when you're getting started, to get more focus on knowing exactly what you want. Even if it's even if you're looking for a property or they're looking for a client, and like when you get that crystal clear vision of okay, mm -hmm. I'm gonna be looking for single family homes in Inglewood that are three bed, two bath, they need a cosmetic rehab, and then when you start putting that into the universe. That's when I found that good things happening. And so the more I've gotten hyper focused, I learned exactly kind of what not to do at my last tech company, where we were just continually trying to go do things in different places. And then you end up doing a lot of nothing because you're losing track of what's kind of right in front of you. Mm -hmm. That makes sense. Um, 
as far as the brokerage goes itself, I just want to understand your process. So you guys find a client, client comes to you, get a loan. Then what are the exact steps that are happening after that point? Mm -hmm. So I'll walk you through the process. So you're going to um, either do a face-to-face -face interview, phone interview, or use our link and then our secure portal to upload your documents right into the portal. And then what we do is we set up a phone call. Um, and if you're doing a purchase, we do issue a pre-approval letter. If you're doing a commercial loan, we're going to issue a term sheet. Make sure that property is going to cash flow because it's going to be based on rent rolls, right? For commercial side. Um, and this is an investor meeting. So that's why I'm talking about that. Um, so oftentimes when you're buying an investment property, it's focused on the, that property more. So when you're buying residential, it's going to be focused on your W-2s or your tax returns and, and getting you approved that way. So then we um, have the pre-approval conversation, walk you through that step. And then we go on to the underwriting. So you'll go under contract to buy your property. And then we will um, make sure that it's cash flowing. We'll order an appraisal and go through the underwriting process and then get you clear to close. That's what I want to talk about more than anything else. This is the underwriting process. And because I know from my own experience, all I hear is it's with the underwriter and I don't really have any clue what that means or what exactly they're doing behind the scenes and you get no access to them. So can you really kind of like dive into like what the underwriter is really doing mm -hmm. behind the scenes? So the underwriter is checking your collateral. They're checking your credit, right? They're reviewing your credit. They're um, really reviewing your income and your assets and making sure that there's no fraud on the file as well, but making sure that everything balances so that you can pay your mortgage on time. Is that or early? Is that something like a proprietary like Excel that they're putting all the information to? Like where are they getting the data? Like how, how are they putting all this information together to give it thumbs up or thumbs down? So we use guidelines. Um, and then if the, if the loan fits in the guidelines, right? So you'll hear about Freddie Mac and Fannie Mae. So if the loan fits in those guidelines, then that's great. But a lot of the loans that we do are a little different. They're usually, we try to use common sense because I don't think you should be denied just because you don't fit in those entities. I don't think that's fair. And I don't think it's realistic either. So I really try to get other options and other guidelines. So the underwriter is just checking to make sure that we're going to pass an audit and that you're going to be able to pay the mortgage. So the underwriter's appraisal, okay, are the comps reasonable? Are they too far away? Your realtor has already typically checked that and done the data report. So you're, we're usually on the same page with the realtor and our appraisers are local. Okay. So that, that helps. Is the underwriting something that happens in-house at a &N? So an mm -hmm. a and employee does all yes. the underwriting? Correct. Okay. And so- they're making sure that when the government comes in to say, okay, a and you said this person fits into this bucket, that's correct. And you should hear some of the weird questions they ask. What? <laughs> you know, just they don't know what, what really goes on in real life. So I'm always very, very protective of my loan officers and my staff. So yeah. I can get through an audit and I've done it very well for many, many years, but they, you know, it, they're employees that have never written loans or dealt with a borrower. So I'm the person that's going in front of them, explaining these documents to them. So you're, you're really just moderating all of these different avenues, bank statements. Oh, well, there's a large deposit for this. Why was it this? You know, and then you have to explain to the auditor, you know, why and what did this happen? And you really have to write Hemingway's in order to pass it. Typically, auditors are not going to give you an A plus and they will tell you, no one's perfect. Da, 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 da. I hate hearing that because yeah. it's like, here's my documents. They're either right or wrong, but they they kind of err on the side of writing you up instead of not because that's how they get paid. Yeah, that makes sense. And this is being recorded. I'm going to be in so much trouble. <laughs> <laughs> so then the loan is processed, right? Everyone gives a thumbs up. What happens to the loan after the closing? So after the closing, the loan is going to go and be sold. So let's say that you close on October 15th. Your first payment is December 1st. Then um, we, we sell off the loans. So once we sell off the loans, we pick the servicer, but you always come back to us. We're going to be your lender for life. So any questions that you have, you're going to go right to your loan officer, and then you're going to make your payments. We recommend that you set them up on auto pay so that you don't miss the payment because life is busy. And then 
every month you get a postcard or an email from us and we follow up because we want to make sure that you're in that right plan, right? So most clients are coming back to us because we did a good job on the first round, but we also, it's so important to work with them again because you know their families are growing. Or in this case, how do we get into our first investment properties? How do we how do we do that? And that's that action step you're taking, right? Yeah. Down the road. Okay. And so you sell it off to a different provider. Servicer. Servicer. And then is that someone that you've already had a relationship with and that's how you set up your loan products? Because you have several different potential like servicers, credit unions or people that you work with as the broker, correct? So we're a banker. So we fund our own loans up to $5 million per transaction. The commercial stuff, we're going to the boards at at a different, that's a different avenue. Um, but in-house for residential, we already have relationships with them. So I have a bid tape and I take the loans out to bid in the morning and then they get their bid tape and then they pick out who who's going to fit with who and why. A bid tape is really an Excel spreadsheet and it sounds very fancy and it's just not. So okay. Yeah. The only thing I knew that about AN that you guys are the actual banker, mm-hmm. different from a broker, right? Broker. A broker is just gonna take your file and, and just kind of put it with the company. If it gets denied, they're gonna go to another company. We have our own guidelines that I have christened, we've all collaborated on. We've said this works, this doesn't work, this protects the borrower, this doesn't protect the borrower. So that's why we can sell directly to all of these agencies. Okay. And so when you have like a, uh, a specific product that you do have a relationship with, like community bank, I know you guys used to have like a 5% down two to four unit. Mm-hmm. That's that... just paused for a slight time. Yeah. Because that... we have to, we, we filled it really fast. But is that a, a product that A&N could provide themselves? Yeah, or... we fund the loan. Okay. So, so we fund our own loans up to $5 million per transaction. And then someone else comes in and servicer, services the loan. Okay, so that's a specific product mm-hmm. that A&N has. Mm-hmm. And then you have a certain amount of loans that you can take on for that specific product until then you package those together mm-hmm. and then those all get sold off. So you're once. talking about mini, mini or bulk. Yeah. sales basically. Okay. And that's how you become master of sales, right? Going back to, I know I get where your head's going. So you can sell on a flow basis, a mini bulks, 10 loans at a package. What now, what I'm trying to take out to bid right now are two packages, one for 60 and a million and another package for, I think it was 33 million. Cause we filled that other order basically really quickly. Okay. And then are all those loans are all similar loans packaged together or can you have multiple different loans packaged as one thing? Yeah. So they could buy off of the bid tape, which is really the Excel spreadsheet and it's not that big of a deal. They could package up. Okay. They sort it and they say, okay, we want these. We're going to buy these from you. We're going to buy these from you. Uh, The reason that I don't service the loans here is I am so sales oriented and borrower facing and LO facing on the front end. That would be the next step in my business and in my career speaking of fear that 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 scares me a little bit right so maybe i get there one day but right now my focus is my los and my borrowers so okay, good. yeah i mean i'm mainly asking all these questions for myself so i'm hoping everyone else gets a lot of value cuz i'm just so curious mm-hmm. on what really happens cuz for me it's it's kind of mysterious sometimes what really happens and those are our trade secrets that you're (laughs) asking about all of them yeah well they're good secrets to know i think because the more people know like who's actually in control of the loan the more someone may want to work with someone because of that aspect Mm -hmm. i just know for me like i'm less although brokers can go out and find tons of great different products i'm more inclined to work with someone who services their own product and is standing behind it if that makes sense you picked the right place to have your events at. <laughs> uh, okay. Well, can you tell me a little bit about just in general, are you doing anything else new with your business? You talked about potentially servicing loans. Like where's a and going? Don't put that from? pressure on me. Cause Here. that's like we really far down the road and I'm not focused. I have, we have Kristen, we want to build her career. We have, we have a lot of new things happening. So I'm focused on other things right now, but um, also that just scares me. So, um, the, some products that we were, we've rolled out and we rolled out well, really well was the, uh, I think you guys are all in the bigger pockets and investor meetups. So we wanted to find a product that was going to work with, for this group. And I was on a mission. I spend, I time block a lot. So I spend about 20 minutes per day 
finding, okay, I'm asking people questions and then I'm finding answers so I can get them what they need for them. So I'm, I'm dealing, I'm boots on the ground, right? So always listening. So we are rolling out a construction loan product because I've noticed that construction costs really went up during COVID and now they're kind of settling down and it's an election year next year. So what happens during an election year? Gas prices go down, rates kind of come down, um, costs for construction will continue to go down a little bit. Um, so we, I, I'm focused a like, I don't know, not not 100% of my day, but a little bit of my day on this construction loan product and rolling that out next. Um, we're also, uh, Q1, we're rolling out a few more states, but you have to make sure when you're rolling out states or you're rolling out new investment properties that you're cash flowing. And it's hard to cash flow in a market where rates you know, are like this and there's not a lot of refis. So we're a very purchase heavy organization right now. And we always have been. But refis, when you do refinances, they're kind of gravy and they really help pay for all the other things that, you know, you need licensing fees, surety bonds, all that stuff. Okay. Do you have some uh, idea on what the terms and whatnot will be for the construction product? Um, I do. So we are going to be, I do, so that I can share. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. I'm going to be, too. it's being recorded. Yeah. <laughs> Um, so we're going to be doing 20% down on the, on the properties for the first, I usually roll out something in tens. Um, and so we're going to probably do 20% down up to $1.2 million and we can do very long-term locks on those. Um, they're going to be very favorable terms. Beautiful. Mm -hmm. Super interesting. So. Cause you're a builder. <laughs> yes. Builder. You build homes. So you need money for your clients. That's that so that's why we have it. Yeah. yeah. So we did the 5% down program basically for this. And then that is the other thing that we were working on. It's awesome. Next. Yeah. What about just some like personal tips and tricks? Do you have like any special morning routine, evening routine? Like what as a business owner, like how do you kind of segment your day to be as productive as possible? So I, I am a time blocker. I hunt in the morning and I, you know, I just think that I am the only person in my household. I fight, I fight for my kids. I pretend I don't even have a husband and I need to make my money to make sure everybody's fed, which is a terrible mindset, I'm sure. Right. I, I pound on myself. Um, and so I think I time block and I'm highly efficient. So in my inbox, I use templates. I make sure that I'm responding quickly with messages. I feel customer service is extremely, extremely important getting back to people because we want to make sure that you have the lowest rate. And when we lock you in that we're shopping every single day. So time blocking, I can't stress enough how important time blocking is, but if it's a customer calls, exactly. Oh, okay. Like how you do it, how of you course. Yeah. Yeah. So time blocking, you use your calendar. So instead of like big to-do lists, you put it on your calendar and making sure that you've blocked enough time for whatever you need to be doing during that day. Um, for example, the 20 minutes a day and working on new products. Well, I know I need new products. So I, I specialize from 11 to 11.20 for products, right? And then I always leave time for interruptions within the hour. And I always leave time for calls. Yeah. Because if you don't, you're you're just, you're behind the eight ball and it's horrible. Yeah. Time, time blocking for sure changed my life. We use a software called Asana for all of our tasks. Stuff. Mm -hmm. So we'd have the tasks, but then I wouldn't actually have the time in my calendar to do it. And for me, I've become a slave to my calendar in a good way. Like mm -hmm. I love my calendar. It's like even like my girlfriend, I was like, I have to put a date on the calendar. Mm -hmm. If it's not on there, like it's highly it. unlikely right. I'm gonna forget about because I have so many things going on. I don't know if it's the same for you, mm -hmm. but I just love my calendar today. Yeah. Oh yeah, that's time blocking. So time blocking is just very important. Yeah, you were going somewhere else when I cut you off. That's okay. You can cut me off. No, it's okay. okay. Um, good. Tips and tricks, morning routine, evening routine. Um, I work a lot, so they're not great. <laughs> Do you work at home? Or I work, no, I, I'm here Tuesday, Wednesday, and Thursday. Um, and on Mondays and Fridays, I work from home. Okay. Mm -hmm. And then how do you balance being a mother of three and working so much? So um, it's like I have my kids help me. So Michael, my oldest, is away at college. But when, when he's home for the summer or when I need something, I will delegate it. Costa will also help me. Eleni is really good at scheduling a lot of things. I mean, we went out to dinner and she made the open table reservation. Her friends are like, why does, why do you do that? My mom works, you know, like it's, you know, but it's also good to delegate and good to empower her as well. Yeah. That's so super smart. Mm -hmm. do, you, do you happen to pay your kids up to like the 13,000? 
500 or whatever that deduction is. I do, but they have to work for it. I don't give out any free tickets. Yeah. So that's a super yeah. awesome hack that I just heard about the other day. Again, that reminded me is that you can actually pay your children uh, up to, I think it's 13,000, right? Do you know what that mm-hmm. number is? Yeah. Well, uh, keep going. Yeah. 13,000. Yeah. And then, and then they also said, but probably not if they're younger than five. So that was the cutoff mark from an accountant I heard. But I highly suggest you talk to your own accountant before you take any of my advice. Right, right, right. <laughs> and you can always put your kids in pictures and magazines, stuff like that. But you do have to show the material in case you get audited by the IRS, which is helpful. I do do a lot of tax strategy things. So if you're buying investment properties and you want to learn about cost segregation, I don't know if you're aware of those. Cost segregation is a wonderful thing on how you depreciate the asset on your tax returns. Yeah, can you talk a little bit about money? Yeah, I exactly thought that would make you excited is. instead of my schedule. <laughs> my schedule is not fun. So let's talk money. That's exciting. Um, so let's say I bought this building, right? I bought this building August 27, 2007. It's seven city lots. Um, we did have done repair work over the time, right? It took about three years to finish this rehab that we just finished. So on this program, you want to then do a cost segregation, it's called. And that's that's with the IRS. You can go to irs.gov and check that out. And what you're going to do is um, basically take all your receipts and your invoices and everything that you've paid, and then you're going to hire a consultant. On this building, the consultant was about $6,000, money well spent. They go in, they put together a cost segregation report, and then you give that to your accountants. You guys got to be careful in who you hire for your accountants. Accountants are not tax strategists, typically. Anybody I've run into that's an accountant, you need to make sure when you build out your team for future investing that you have the right team and you communicate well with your team. So my accountant, I brought the concept to the accountant. Why am I Why am I doing that, right? Because the accountants aren't thinking that logically, right? They're just, they're, they're thinking logically. I said that wrong. They're counting, right? They're counting these numbers. Well, you need to be the CEO of your own business in your head or whatever career path you're doing and make sure you take full charge of that and then align with all of your team. So make sure that when you understand how to do the cost segregation that you're doing it legally and properly, but then you end up getting a, t- a tax write-off because of the way you refile the tax returns. So as long as it makes sense to do, then you want to do it and pay the, pay the fees and pay the uh, refiling and amendments for your tax returns. And you need to always check their work also. Yeah, because I think they actually hire like a, they call it an engineer in the cost side world that actually goes through and does all the mathematical calculations of depreciating all the parts. So they break it down into each specific part Mm -hmm. of the building and then accelerate that depreciation so you can take all that savings. So I think we have a lot of first time investors or have one one property maybe if that's if I was reading the room correctly. So by doing that like on your schedule E right now you guys have it's just a regular tax return. So on your if you're just having a couple residential four units and less multi units that aren't in an LLC. So you're going to want to make sure on your schedule E that you've balanced your tax return. Don't just sign the tax return and then if there's schedules behind that making sure the supporting documents are there as well. Even though the accountant doesn't ask for it, you need to make sure you're very organized because that's how you can pick up efficiently and effectively your next property. Beautifully said. I feel like I'm cutting you off. Sorry. No, you're good. Uh, So let's just say I run into Nina at the coffee shop. You've built a big successful business. Like what's your one piece of advice you would give to anyone who's getting started in real estate, starting a business to be successful? So for me, starting a business was to serve others. You don't necessarily have to just start a new business to start a new business because you want to control your own destiny, control like Kristen. I'm very involved with Kristen. Um, I want to see her as successful as possible so she can build, we can build her brand within this business because the shell is already there. So finding ways to scale, that's going to be a lot easier on her and it's not going to take her as much time, right? So in your career path, we want to make sure we lay out your career path properly. The second step is start young. Do not continue to wait. Waiting is a disaster and it's it comes from a place of fear, be fearless and get into your first property. My first rental property I purchased, my first property I purchased at 24, I still own it. 
Um, it has brought me a lot of luck and a lot of like goodwill. Um, I've been able to help families, my nieces, because they went to UIC and they are they stayed there. My my niece got pregnant with her husband and now they have two kids and they're staying there now, um, paying just you know the the basic nut. But that property, I feel like for a family has brought a lot of wealth and, and good fortune because I bought that so young. My second rental property I bought um in Old Town. And that one does very well. I think that was 25 when I bought that one. And then the next one I bought was 1122 West Catalpa. And that one has always done extremely well. So picking up some rental properties quicker, I think starting off in a multi-unit, I know that is that is a great thing to do for me. Starting off in a multi-unit wasn't going to happen because I had too many things on my plate. So making sure your time management is really good so you don't become crabby, basically. you know. I think that might be, if you don't have a book yet, your first book title, Be Fearless. Well, thanks. Yeah. Uh, so I'm going to kind of wrap it up there and open it up to any questions anyone might have about a and about Nina, about mortgages, about underwriting. And you guys can ask me anything, please. Andy. Yes, servicing. So you said you create data. So like, okay. Just thinking about teaching myself, like I have, I have a my primary, I, I, I went to guaranteed rates and then they sold it to Chase. Mm -hmm. So I think guaranteed rates have their own goal and then they sold it to Chase. It was like a match up that mortgage. Are you doing something like that? Are you creating your okay. Yep. You got it. So the guidelines. Yeah. So the guidelines are a and guidelines. Anytime you want to get approved with Freddie Mac or Fannie Mae or Chase or anything else, you have to go through a very, you know, serious due diligence process before they're going to sign you up. But again, that's what we do on the mortgage banking side. So our guidelines um, are going to be different than guaranteed rates guidelines. Does that make sense? Yeah. 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 So what happens if, like, uh, you said you're like a $69 million package, it's on a spreadsheet. What happens if they say, hey, we want $65 the other $4 million? Then you find somebody else to co-issue with that. This is really deep. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. It was a good question. No, right, right, right. Then you're finding somebody else to, it's like um, if there's a million dollar note, you can find two servicers, whoever wants to service it, but then this, it's securitized probably by two different people behind it. But again, all of this is like so far behind the scenes that um, you want to focus on the front end, right? Of the process, I, I would think. No, 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 don't be sorry. <laughs> I didn't mean to shut you down. Yeah. But I don't want you, I just, didn't want anyone to worry about that part. But yeah, it's a great question. Yeah, really good question. What else? Any um, other questions? Are there any any questions about getting into your first rental property? Um, a lot of you have already, I think, one property maybe, and then not sure how to get into the second pro property. Do you guys want to talk about that a little bit maybe? Um, so I think what you want to do is set up a separate fund, uh, a bank account, and then just start putting money into that and name it your house fund. So that would be your next investment. So let's say you needed 10% down. You've lived in your three flat for two years now. Um, you can rent that one out fully. And then you want to try to get into the next deal with five or 10% down to get into that next property. Usually you want 10% down to cash flow if that makes sense. So I think earmarking your, your funds is a really important way to save money. Earmarking, what am I doing? What am I doing this month? Did I really need to go to the container store? Probably not, right? Put that money into that bank account for the next property. I was thinking about going up on FEMA on the first property to pay for a second. Is there any other different strategies? So the question was, I'm just going to repeat it. Yeah, so please. Here, but yeah, so basically he's working to get a second property. Your suggestion was put in a slush fund just for that property. But if there's any other ways he, to get money available, such as a line of credit on his current primary residence. And so... One, my question to you would be, do you guys do home market lines of credits? Yep. But two, is there any other suggestions you have mm -hmm. to get that money for the next down payment? Absolutely. So on the next property that you're buying, are you thinking it's residential? I'll give you a couple of examples, maybe. 
So let's say that you're buying your next one as a residential property and you already took out your line of credit. So you're going to tap maybe some of that money. You can also tap if you have a cash value of a life insurance policy. I highly recommend that everybody at least has term life insurance, especially after 9-11, you need to make sure you take care of your families. Um, But variable life insurance is a great way to invest in your portfolio and that money grows and you can always borrow. So when I bought this building, um, I used the down payment. I needed to come in with 10% down. I did an SBA loan, right? So I took a a 90% out, 10% down loan on a commercial property. So you do a 50, 40, it's called 50% first. And a SBA comes in and does a 40% second. And I used the down payment off of my life insurance policy and it worked out great. And that is how Walt Disney started also. So um, there's also, you can look to see if your 401k has any options to take a loan out, right? Um, Is that the best way to do it? I think taking from, if you don't want to just do the cash, I like to use different sources so that one is not so heavy because then all of a sudden you have your money and you can over time pay back, you know, those items and it just doesn't feel stressful. Yeah. Also, if you happen to have like a Roth uh, 401k, you can take out all your distributions without uh, any back. So. It's a good tax trip. I love that. Yeah. Little tip. I didn't know that. I did it. So that's great. <laughs> Double down in real estate. Yeah. Jeff. Uh, I've always wanted to use a 203k loan. And um, what do you think is the best way to utilize it? And then two, can you explain from contract to close and funding and project and how that works? Sure. So 203k loan, what the best way to utilize it is and what the full kind of process is from contract to close. So on an FHA 203k loan, the best way to utilize that program and who it's best used for is let's say you are an owner occupant borrower. You're buying your maybe first first property and you just want to put three and a half percent down. If you sign with your realtor and the seller, you're the buyer, you sign and you have a 60 day close, you need to meet with your contractor immediately because you need to get a scope of work right off the bat and you need to go fast. Some contractors will charge a fee for it. I think it's well worth it because you're asking them to stop their day and get it done as quickly as possible. Um, but that that is the key. And it's really not that hard at all. So when you do an FHA 203k loan, it feels daunting and overwhelming that if you have your paperwork done and you use our site to upload everything, and then you like, let's say you have a property, then you're going to call him. You're going to get your scope of work done quickly. And then the key on those is to make sure we have a miscellaneous column because things change, right? And we make sure that we discuss how that miscellaneous column is going to work and when you need to gather funds from there. Um, And then you go through the underwriting process. The appraisal is going to be subject to completion with the value after. So that is where the data comes in and we make sure we're checking, okay, is this property going to be worth this amount of money later on? We need to make sure it is because you don't want to be upside down on it. And you don't want to build a white elephant. I don't know if you guys know what that is. Never buy a white elephant when you're doing investing. A white elephant is a house that is either just way too big for the block or over-improved. You want it when you're investing, you want to be on the block a little bit smaller. In my opinion, it's my opinion. As far as the 203k loan goes, will you guys service that and and be the uh, distributor for the contract? Bless you. On a 203k loan, I will not. With our new products, because we're not approved for FHA 203k, on the construction loan, we would be. So if you did a 20% down million dollar purchase, right, then we would do the the disbursements. If you want to work in that direction, we can work a lot more to get All right. the two or three K products. Yep, so. we can absolutely do that. Any other last minute questions? We'll take one more. Yes, sir. Uh, if you actually talk a little bit about taking out uh like a lot, I Sure. So the question was, um, how do I take out money from my 401k? That was not the question. The question was, how do I, I should let you repeat it. Sorry. Yeah, that was a question. Like uh, you need extra money for the next down payment Mm -hmm. and you you have potentially money in your Roth 401k or traditional 401k. Uh, Is there any, do you know what the implications are taken out in both sides? So let's say you had, um, 
principal 401k. The employer has to set a rule like you can borrow and take a loan out. And then you go on their website and you literally click loan. You pick the term. Typically, if you're buying a property, you're going to want to take the longest term so that your debt to income ratio on the front end is going to qualify, but you can always pay it back earlier. So each employer works with a different um, 401k company and their terms are going to be right on their website or on the statement you receive. If you receive mail statements, it'll be on the back. Yeah, that's what I was thinking too. If you could, because you can borrow from your 401k sometimes. And I was like, huh, is the lender going to know if that's where the money's going to come from and then going to use that against your DTI? But no, we don't do that here, but some banks do do that. Oh, so, no, it won't. So you wouldn't. Use I, that. We, in our guidelines, we don't, but some banks do do that. Oh, so well, another reason. We I'm view it as, yeah, it's your own funds. So but each bank is different, right? So I don't know what what is that bank. I don't work there, so I don't know. But I know we've gotten clients that have been like coming here because of that. Yeah, no, that's a good idea too because I know I borrowed against my uh, for my actual four hundred one k before when I was with my company. But me still, like, I don't have access to my four hundred one k even now because I'm still technically a consultant and employed and I actually desperately want access to that so I can self-direct that money into some other investments but I'm, I'm handcuffed right now until we finish some other uh, litigation issues with my past projects so oh uh, but yeah so I'm gonna kind of cut it off there um, obviously the best way to get a hold of you is through email, text, uh, your website. Obviously text, yeah, I'm a big texter. If you need something right away, I'm text. If it's like a day, I mean, I try to respond, but okay. an email. Any social okay. channels. Yeah, people... Nina Vlamas. I mean, you'll just put in my name and you'll you'll find me. And then um, the folders are all here. So our website is anmtg.com, Apple, Nancy, Mary, Tom, George.com. And then you can apply right on there and reach reach any of us as well. Okay. Yeah. And my name is Jonathan Clem again. I'm with Quality yeah. Builders. We're on Instagram, I think TikTok even, now, which I'm not a TikToker, but we're on TikTok, LinkedIn, all of the regular channels. If you can invite more people to our events, if you have any constructive feedback, we greatly appreciate it. Uh, make sure you just find the next person in the room you're supposed to talk to. It might be Jeffrey Ma if you're interested in wholesaling. He's got a mastermind coming up, so make sure you hop on that. And I just always remind everyone um, to embrace getting uncomfortable um, because that's kind of what this is all about, is um, getting comfortable being uncomfortable.